You probably know that there's over 7 billion people on Earth today. But you might not know that the global middle class is growing faster now than at any time in history. In fact, there's over 400,000 people who will join the middle class today and every day into the future. That's 160 million people every year who are going to want their refrigerators, their cell phones, and their washing machines. We're going to need to build 14 million buildings by the year 2050. That's 1,000 buildings per day, every day, for 33 years just to keep up. 10 billion people are going to need their highways, their hospitals, their education and energy, their water and wheat. But there's a problem. Current methods for building the world around us are running into environmental, social, economic, and resource constraints. In fact, 30% of all construction spend is waste, often due to bad planning. After all, each building that you see and live in are often just the beta release. So if we're going to imagine, design, and create a better world, we're going to need to innovate. We need to do more, better, and with less. Now, I work for a software company called Autodesk, and we make tools for people who make things. It's our customers who are the ones that build all the buildings in the world, the smartphones that you use, the bridges that you drive over, and even the movies that entertain you. And our software tools allow people to test their ideas virtually, simulate the real world in a virtual space before you bring it into the physical world. So our customers are the ones that simulate stress and strain, like on these mechanical parts. Or fluids, when engineers are studying things like aerodynamics. Some of our customers even simulate light. Many of the movies that you watch are actually simulations of billions of photons of light bouncing it around in a virtual scene made out of millions of surfaces on their way to a virtual camera. It can take hundreds of thousands of cores to render a, a normal movie these days. Now, simulation is a really powerful tool, but there's a problem. Every time you increase the resolution of a simulation, every time you double the resolution, the amount of compute power required goes up by a factor of eight. We are talking about an order n cubed problem here, and that's really not a fun place to be. These simulations can take hours or often days. So let's take a car seat, for example. We want it to be light for fuel economy, but we want it to be strong enough to save our lives. Imagine we had just one variable to optimize, the thickness of the metal. If we make it too thin, we die. We make it too thick, and we waste fuel. So what is the optimal choice between these two constraints? Well, before the cloud, Simulation was like a game of battleship, right? You figure out your initial guess at the thickness for the metal. It's like E6. You wait three hours for the simulation to come back and tell you, miss. So let's make the metal a little thicker. Wait another three hours, miss. By the time you get a hit, you're willing to settle for any acceptable solution rather than having the patience to find the optimal solution. This process does not scale. And that is where AWS comes in. You see, in the same time that it takes to do one simulation on one computer, in the cloud, we can scale it up. We can run 100 variations of this part on 100 servers in the same three hours. And something new emerges. The computers become our design partner. Instead of just validating our design, it is now telling us, it has found what the optimal design is. But that's just level one of using the cloud for simulation. Because we only had one variable, and we could use a brute force approach. But of course, real design problems have many variables. We can't use a brute force approach. We need to level up. Now, Lightning Motorcycles is an Autodesk customer. They make the world's fastest production motorcycle. Oh, and it just happens to be electric. Now, the thing about being a winner is you want to stay a winner. 
And Lightning came to us wanting to make this part lighter, the swing arm. It has a tremendous amount of force on it, and so it's a heavy part on the bike. It impedes the performance. It's a complex problem because there's almost an infinite number of ways that we could potentially remove material from this part. We can't try every possibility. So instead, we used a process called generative design. Now, as before, a human provides an initial starting point. The cloud on many parallel computers do many different simulations, sometimes removing a little material here, a little material there. Some simulations find out they actually have to add some material back. It gives a surprising organic result. But it's lighter and it's stronger. In many ways, generative design mimics evolution. Rather than a population of competing organisms, what we have here is a virtual population of competing parts in a simulation. One of these here is an actual cat pelvis, one is a dog pelvis, and one is a motorcycle swing arm. At level two, something new emerged again. When we up the scale, we now have synthetic evolution. So let's look at level three. In this case, Rather than provide an initial design, we're only going to provide the constraints. Where does the part attach to the bike? What are the forces involved? And what kind of materials are we willing to use in the manufacturing process? The cloud isn't just converging on a solution from our design. We didn't give it a design. It is divergently thinking. It is exploring creatively the possible design space. And this is where the human imparts our values into the process. See, we have to make judgments between potential optimal solutions. How do we want to make the trade-off between things like safety versus cost, or weight versus environmental impact? Once we've chosen a design, we can use AWS again to help optimize its manufacture. What's the best way to print? How can we use machining to finish the part? The result is something amazing, surprising actually. The cloud has produced something beyond organic. It's like playing evolution forward a few million years in an afternoon. Now, aircrafts are some of the most highly optimized machines that we make. They have to provide safety at low weight. It's a hard design problem. We worked with Airbus to lightweight this part, the bulkhead of their latest A320 aircraft. It's an already highly engineered part for lightweight and safety. Again, we used generative design, this time with an algorithm that was inspired by the growth patterns of an organism called Physarium polycephalum. And try saying that fast in front of a lot of people. Autodesk software powered by AWS came up with 10,000 solutions. Each met the requirements, but with different trade-offs. Now, in an industry where a 5% weight reduction is considered a huge deal, this part is an astonishing 45% lighter. And here's the thing. It's actually stronger than the part that it replaces. Now, if applied to the entire fleet of A320s, Airbus estimates that the fuel savings would be equivalent to removing 96,000 vehicles from the road. Imagine the environmental impact. And imagine applying generative design not just to that part, but many other critical parts, such as the hundreds of seat supports. And what if we applied generative design to the entire aircraft? Wouldn't that make flying fun again? Doing more better and with less is possible when you reimagine things with the cloud at scale. But so far, we have only looked at physical goods. Let's think back to that thousand buildings a day that we're going to need to build. You know, architects really haven't had the choice or the option to consider all of the ramifications and trade-offs of every design decision that they make, and they certainly couldn't ponder the needs and whims of all of the inhabitants. But the cloud can. 
For Autodesk's latest office building, we used generative design, and we had the usual goals around cost and space and environmental impact, and we simulated everything. We did light, scenic views, travel paths, energy efficiency, and many more, but we also surveyed the inhabitants. Who do you have meetings with? How bothered by noise are you? How often do you get coffee? We incorporated everyone's input and brought it into this design. Imagine scaling this approach to entire cities. Generative design lets us look deeper into our design problems, helping us make better choices. So let's level up again. Everyone's talking about machine learning. And if you're listening, you also know that you need a lot of training data to make machine learning effective. Now, if you're Amazon or Google or Facebook, you've got a lot of data, and that's great. But if you're a startup, well, good luck. Any of you remember this video game, Breakout? Not old enough? I am. It was the original video game. I used to stay up all night learning to master this. Now, in the cloud, we can teach a computer to play in a simulation. It can randomly move the paddle back and forth and it'll notice that sometimes, with some movements, it gets a higher score, and sometimes it doesn't. It's learning. It's synthetic training data being generated by the cloud. But it's a slow process. But of course, the cloud allows us to scale it. And so overnight, a computer in the cloud with many parallel machines generating synthetic training data can become the world master champion at Breakout. And unlike when you try and teach your friend here how to, how to play, when the cloud learns breakout, all computers have learned to master breakout. Now, with traditional robots, absolute conformity and precision is required. If any of these machines is out of calibration, well, the entire production line will grind to a halt. Wouldn't it be great if we could stop having to conform the world to the needs of our machines and instead have the machines adapt to us and to the world as it is. Automating a simple task of trying to pick a part out of a bucket requires an army of software engineers. But at Autodesk, we created virtual robots with virtual parts, a virtual camera, virtual light, virtual shadows, virtual physics, and we ran a simulation in the cloud, in parallel, on many machines, doing random things, generating synthetic training data. The cloud lets us scale. And we've applied this in the real world with the 3D printing using robotic welding. The thing about welding is that molten metal flows in random ways. And the robot sees that randomness and adapts its approach to get the desired outcome. But we didn't write any code to do this. The machine learned how to do this using synthetic training data of synthetic robots in the cloud and then could translate that into the real world. So Autodesk's mission is to imagine, design, and create a better world. And AWS has been a really great partner with that mission. They've allowed, allowed us to focus on simulation and generative design rather than on managing storage and databases. And Amazon has continually been updating their game as well, you know, bringing down the cost of computing. And as we saw today with that P3 instance, bringing the horsepower that we need for this new future. After today, if anything, I hope you'll see the cloud differently. The cloud isn't just about moving computers from on-premise to some provider. It's an opportunity to reimagine what you're really trying to accomplish. Every time we increase the scale of computing, a new phenomenon emerges from optimization, to bio biology-inspired evolution, to creative exploration, to synthetic learning. With generative design, the computer is becoming our partner, almost an empathic collaborator. Yes, it's still just a tool. But unlike the microscope and the telescope that let us see the world as it is, the cloud lets us see the worlds that could be. It's up to us to make the choices. If design is the process about envisioning a better future, 
How will you use the cloud to make a better world? Thank you.